God bless you. Daniel chapter 3, 16 to 20. Daniel chapter 3, 16 to 20. This is a familiar story with familiar characters with funny names. Daniel 3, go ahead, turn there, get your Bibles, get your tablet or your phone, get your Bible, like, like the, your real paper Bible, that would be great too. Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 to 20. If you're there, this is what it says. <clears throat> I have it on the, the screen. should be showing up right there. Got it? Daniel 3, 16 to 20. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and throw them into the blazing furnace. These men had the courage of their convictions. The courage. Have you heard that saying? Have the courage of your convictions. Last Sunday we talked about convictions. And this whole week we've been celebrating an awesome God and believing what we declare God is able and willing to do for us. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Do you know them? Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. They're the people that we say had the courage of their convictions. Their names were changed later to Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. In case you didn't know. At that time, Babylon conquered Israel and Judah. Babylon was a big empire. They conquered Judah. Before, the, before that, the Assyrians came, remember? Before that, uh, later the Persians came. Later on, the Greeks would take over. Later on, the Maccabeans would happen. Oh, a lot of people have been conquering Israel and Judah. Uh, that's the practice at that time. When you conquer a certain land, you get the best and the brightest. You know, the cream of the crop. Ha, some of you come from schools that call you the cream of the crop. My school call us, calls us the cream of the cream of the crop. That's called fluff. Oh, anyway. These men of noble lineage, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, they had no physical defects, superior in intelligence. They were exiled. They were forcibly taken from their country into the central district of Babylon. Why? Maybe for some knowledge, because they were the best and brightest. Maybe for interbreeding. I don't know. But whatever, that was the practice at that time. These Jewish aristocrats were exiled into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. Their names were changed later on. Hananiah became Shadrach. Mishael became Meshach. And Azariah became Abednego. They first come into the spotlight, or we first hear of them with a guy named Daniel. They, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, were taken into them to custody and they, were, they refused to eat the non-kosher food given by the king. So the king said, okay, these are the best and the brightest. You will now eat at my table. You will eat my food, my kind of diet. Hey! But we hear that these three men said, no, we'd rather not. We'd rather not defile ourselves, but we will eat only vegetables. Oh, no, 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 no. King said, the king's and his sister said, no. You will eat what the king eats. No. 
we won't. Later on, they were tested. Remember this? <clears throat> they were tested and they were proven to be healthier than those that were eating other stuff. That tells you, okra and saluyot. Anyway, <laughs> later, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were appointed to official government positions. And they showed that they were 10 times better than their Babylonian counterparts. In every area of the arts and the sciences, of medical science and technology, of every aspect of living at that time, they were 10 times better. They were excellent. Excellent even in exile. Take that. That's another alternative title for this. Excellence in exile. They were trapped by their enemies. Because, of course, if you're starting to go up in terms of rank and position and influence, they had enemies. The enemies ordered them to bow down to a 90-foot golden statue of the emperor, of course. Again, they refused that. The, th the king himself threatened them. If you don't bow down to that statue, 90 feet gold, 90, 90 feet high, wow. If you don't bow down to that gold statue, I will be throwing you into the furnace. And then they talked to the king. The, king, the passage we read, Daniel 3, 16 to 20, was actually the conversation between Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and King Nebuchadnezzar. We know what happened. In the end, God was with them. That's a lesson to take away from this. God is always with you if, a, if you take a stand for righteousness. God is always with you if you exercise faith and exercise the courage of your convictions. Right and righteousness is on your side. <clears throat> God was with them even inside the fiery furnace. And they were delivered miraculously and mightily. This is the passage that says, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were men of courage who had the courage of their convictions. All right, let's get into the story. We remember them today because they exhibited great faith in God. Let me show you what we have here. There you go. I'll give you all of it already so that I don't have to worry. Great faith in God. They didn't just know God. These people really trusted in Him. They did not just believe in God. They trusted in Him. See, belief and trust is very different. You putting your lives, you putting a thought into your mind and heart about who God is. You believe in Him. But you putting your whole life into His hands, that's trusting in Him. <clears throat> They were thrown into a fiery furnace because they believed in God and they trusted in Him. See, faith in God made them say no even when it was easier for them to say yes. It was more convenient, more comfortable to say yes. Faith, that the faith that they had and the conviction they had was more about pleasing God than appeasing man. Truly, and we see that there, faith honors God always, and God always honors faith. You might say it's easy to believe in God when you see miracles happening around you. Well, it was not like that at all for these men. These men are what you call, uh, they had the faith, even if he does not kind of faith. Remember what they said, even if he does not, their faith was courageous. Their faith was based on convictions. Ultimately, it was about their conviction and the courage they got from standing up for what they believe. <clears throat> Martin Luther King Jr. said this, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Beautiful words. Now, there's a lot to unpack in terms of this short story, what they said to the king, what their confrontation was about, it really showed faith, it really showed conviction, it really showed courage, and this is how it looks like. Three points. Number one, 
it looks like ultimate authority. Hmm. This is ultimate authority. It's talking about who is really the boss. Who's really in charge? What's going on in a chaotic situation? You have to ask. Who's really in charge? Who's the boss? Verse 16. In front of the highest living person at that time, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. They were being asked, go and bow or you will burn. And their choice, we're going to burn. Why? In this matter, we don't need to defend ourselves before you, O king. We ultimately answer to God. That's what they were saying. We recognize your position, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. We recognize and understand the politics behind this whole exile thing. We actually respect you. They were on good, friendly terms. But ultimately, when it comes to my soul and its eternal destiny, they were telling the king, we answer to a higher authority than you. There is an ultimate authority over our lives, over our destiny, over eternity. He has the final say. We don't need to answer to you regarding this matter because we answer to a higher ultimate authority. Your king, your emperor, but he is God. Mm. I remember a story in the New Testament. Remember the equivalent of this in Acts chapter 4? Before the, the breakout of the church, as we know it today, we see Peter and John arrested for preaching Jesus. They were preaching the name of Jesus. They were commanded not to speak, not to preach, not to teach about Jesus anymore. And they were the ones that say, should we obey you or obey God? That's similar to what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were doing. Well, should we obey you, our civil authorities? We do respect you. We obey you. But in this matter, we answer to a higher authority. They were actually saying and proclaiming it with conviction. This was with conviction because of the threat of death, not just any kind of death. We're talking about burning in a fiery furnace seven times the normal heat to the point that whoever was going to throw them in actually died. Or the people that threw them in, they died because of the heat. What? Paul or Peter and John, like Paul in the New Testament, were saying Jesus Christ has the final say. He is the ultimate authority. We answer to him. Do you see the courage? The courage in their conviction and how they stood for that and what they were actually saying. They were saying, they were being asked, bow or burn? Quickly, without hesitation, with conviction, they said, burn. If it's for Jesus, we'll burn. Now, don't take that literally today. That's not happening, or is it? But somehow, we're not going to be tested in that way. We're going to be tested in different ways. You have to know who is the ultimate authority in your life. Who has a say? Who's really in charge? Who's the boss? Who do you ultimately answer to? You know what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they got that from someone like Daniel. Daniel was their like mentor and close friend. You know Daniel, the meaning of the word Daniel, or the name Daniel? God is my judge. God is my judge. He's actually saying with his name and how he lived, I answer to him. He is the ultimate judge of my life. I am accountable to him in the decisions I make today. Ask yourself, are you like Daniel, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that has the courage of their convictions to say, this is what I believe. This is what has been revealed to me in Jesus Christ. And I stand with it. He is the ultimate authority in my life. That's how it looks like. 
courage in your conviction. Number two, it looks like, <clears throat> oh, let me, oh, I have it there. Number two, it looks like genuine faith. Genuine faith. It's not fake faith. It's a lot of fake stuff going on today. It's asking yourself, do you really believe what you believe? Do you really believe in what you are saying you believe? Do you really trust the truth, the availability, the willingness of a God to deliver you? Will you entrust your life to him? Look at verse 17. In that conversation, Shadrach, Meshach, and, say, uh, and, and uh, Abednego were saying, the God we serve, oops, you remember the ultimate authority? The God we serve, you know, he's actually able to deliver us from your hand. And you know, he will. At the point and with the threat of death and annihilation, their answer, you know, the God we serve is able and willing to deliver us, and he will deliver us. They didn't know the story, how the story would unfold. We do, because we read it before. It happened many, many, many years ago. But for them, this is it. They were probably strengthened by their faith, strengthened by being with one another. But they said, here we go. They had the firm persuasion, the unswerving, unwavering conviction. They were convinced that God was able and willing. Sometimes we recognize that God is powerful and that he is able. Ask yourself, do you know that God is willing? God is willing. He wants to. He is able to and he wants to. Hmm. Remember the leprous man encountered by Jesus in, in Luke chapter 5. The leprous man comes to Jesus. Jesus, son of David. If you are willing, do you remember that? Jesus, if you're willing, make me clean. Jesus said, I'm willing. I know you're able. Are you willing? Do you want to? You need to know this. God's heart is a God of blessing. It's a heart of blessing, a heart of grace, a heart of love for you. Powerful. God is able. God is willing. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. They were saying, I'm not sure what's going to happen. But you know, no matter what kind of furnace you heat, no matter what kind of law or statue you put up, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were saying, God can deliver us from it. Whatever trouble you have set up for us because of our stand for right and righteousness, I'm telling you, God can deliver us. No doubt, God can no doubt, God will. E. Stanley Jones, a powerful man of prayer, he says this, Faith is not merely your holding on to God. It is God holding on to you. He will not let you go. Oh, it's not dependent on how you hold on to him. The beauty of your words and however you confess it, that's all powerful stuff. But it's not dependent on what you confess or what you profess. If it were, the, let's just have a contest of how loud we can be or how eloquent we can be with our prayers. No, it's not. It's a matter of in our hearts trusting that God is holding on to you. He will not let you go, says E. Stanley Jones. Now, that's powerful stuff, right? Amen. But that's also where the problem begins. I thought that's a good thing. It is. But that's where the problem is. Let me explain. We know that God is able. We understand that He is willing. We have totally surrendered to His authority over whatever problem or whatever prayer. Now, we know He is powerful. We know He can deliver. This is the question. Why doesn't He? Pastor, if you keep saying that God is able, and God is willing, why doesn't he? I mean, I've been in this situation, I've had this prayer, I'm praying for this situation, I'm praying for that brother, that sister, this sickness, this problem, this conflict. If God is able and he's willing, why isn't he doing it? Right? Is that a valid question? Yeah. 
And this is where most of us get stuck. The conflict between our minds and our hearts. See, if we're honest, we actually have a hidden belief tucked in somewhere there. If God loves me, why doesn't he do what I want? If God is truly a God of blessing and He is willing and able and He loves me, why doesn't He do what I think is right? It is at this intersection and profession and reality that you need trust, that you need courage, that you need conviction. You realize that your beliefs need to turn into convictions. Remember what we talked about last Sunday? Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about in terms of strong convictions, go and refer to last Sunday's preaching. Strong convictions. Look at this. Even if he does not, I will still do what is right. I will still do what is righteous. Conviction. The courage in your convictions to say, even if he does not. Pause. Think about it. <laughs> this is what we call, and this is how it looks like. Number three, complete trust. Complete trust. Ask God, or ask yourself. <clears throat> do you really trust him, or do you trust the outcome? Do you trust the Lord or do you trust that the answer to your prayers will come? What if they don't come? Does that change God? Does that change your faith? Do you trust God or do you trust the outcome to your prayer? Verse 18. They were probably in tears in the serious conviction and saying, even if he does not, we're trusting him. We want you to know, king, we will not serve your gods. We will not do and compromise what we know is unrighteous. Even if that God does not do what we want him to do. <sighs> Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego had complete trust. It was not dependent on the outcome, not dependent on the circumstance. Up. Oh, Boss, think about this. It's easy when times are like blessed. How about for some of us that have not been, our prayers are not answered. Do you trust that God knows what he's doing? Some of us that have had long lingering stuff that have been, we've been years now bringing it up to God and struggling with this. We've called it a thorn, a big, 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 thorn in your flesh. Will you trust that this grace is sufficient? Will you trust he knows what he's doing? Will you trust that he still loves you and has a purpose for that being in your life at this time? Will you trust? Not just trust, but completely, totally, wholeheartedly trust in him. Do not waver during these tough times. Do not waver. It is tried, it is tested, it is challenged, but will it hold your faith? Your Christianity, the right and righteousness that you have stood for, is not temporary. Is it really there? Antoine de Sana Supri says, Of what worth are convictions that bring not suffering? Hmm. Of what worth are convictions that bring not suffering? Oh my. <laughs> and I say this. Many people have strong convictions on Sunday that become simple conveniences on the weekdays. What if that comfort or that convenience was taken out? Will you have like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego say, even I, or like Daniel, even if I'm thrown into the lion's den, even if, I, even if I'm thrown into the fiery furnace, I will not do what is against what I believe. 
Mm -hmm. So, some good questions for us, therefore. Do we believe in God because He answers our prayers? Has God's silence and seeming inaction lessened your faith in Him? Has life's disappointments, discouragements, and difficulties affected your trust in Him? What if God delays? What if God denies? Or simply, what if God doesn't? Even if He does not. You know who is the ultimate authority. You know who you have put your genuine faith in. Now it's time to completely trust in Him. Time to exercise the courage of your convictions. Brothers and sisters, I hope that we never get into a point of testing like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, or Daniel. I kind of know that we will not go through exactly the same thing. But you have your own trials. You have your own way of being tested in terms of what you believe in and if you really believe in that. And if in standing up to that, you develop courage. Courage. Because you know what? Courageous. Courageous even in difficult times. That's what we are about as Christians. Standing up for God. Standing up for good. Standing up for right. Standing up for righteousness. Has life's disappointments, discouragements, and difficulties affected your trust in Him? Good question. Good question. This pastor said, oh, I said it pala. <clears throat> he doesn't promise to keep you away from the fire, but He promises to be with you through it. I'll say that again for those of you that missed that. I don't think I have it on the slide. He doesn't promise to keep you away from the fire, but He promises to be with you through it. That's our God. That's who we have believed. Jesus, the ultimate authority of our life, our eternity. Amen? I'm going to invite everyone to bow their heads in prayer.